Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Straight Spouse Network podcast, Straight Spouse Voices. I'm your host, Kristen Kelbley. Our guest today is Ross Rosenberg. His book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, sold over 110,000 copies and has been translated into nine languages. Ross is a keynote speaker and educator who has presented in 30 states, 70 cities, and abroad. He's been regularly featured on national TV and radio. Ross, welcome to the podcast today. It's a pleasure to have you. But today's topic is, in a word, is narcissism. I want to make it clear, and I, I think you would agree, we're, this is not about people who are married to people who are questioning their sexuality, who are confused, who are grappling with their sexuality, who genuinely care for their straight partners, who are agonized over you know, what this might do to the family if they come out. We're talking about the variety of individual who is like seeking a cover wife, cover life for Um, you know, think the politician, and I can think of a couple without naming names. Think the pastor of the megachurch who's got the cover wife and the kids and the grandchildren, and then is got some illicit activities that are happening maybe a couple of states away at um, some nightclubs and things like that, that the wife then finds later. So we're talking about a specific kind of marriage that a straight partner might find themselves in with a closeted narcissistic individual. And I want to be really clear about that. For a sociopath to get what they need, they have to figure out a way to manipulate people in order to serve them. The smarter the sociopath, um, the more they are able to overcome their obstacles. So if you are um, an educated, intelligent sociopath who requires a certain status in order to get what you need, they are able to manipulate and hurt others so easily because they do not have what the very human block, which is empathy and any feelings of guilt or shame. For many sociopaths who happen to be gay, now let me be very, very clear. Someone's sexual orientation, someone's sexual preferences, it's, they are independent of psychopathology independent. So when I talk about sociopaths who happen to be straight, or for that matter, gay, um, my expertise is in the sociopathy. The sociopath who needs to fit in society requires a backdrop. They require um, some form of proof of their their legitimacy so they can operate successfully and comfortably in the real world, have a job, make money, get prestige, And often that requires a relationship, if not a marriage. It's almost like they want to fit into a painting and look normal. And so to do that, they absolutely know they they need to get married. They need to get a house. They need to get children so that no one will question their despicable, furtive, and often um, harmful and abusive intentions. And it's that creation of the backdrop allows them to operate with sometimes uh, no detection. And why straight spouses might live 20 years, 30 years in a relationship and then discover something that a whole new, a, a whole world of behavior, you know, it starts with one credit card receipt or one misplaced phone call or one uh, chat or a text or something like that, that you uncover. And then it goes down a rabbit hole and they uncover a whole life of someone right. that they didn't know. And um, which can happen in heterosexual relationships too. I want to be really clear, but there's the added right. layer of the closet, which makes it, you know, just even more confusing and, um, and, and kind of mind screwing, <laughs> if we right. can use that term. <laughs> right. So what are some, um, what are the, what's the primary mechanism, I want to say, that um, narcissists, covert narcissists, sociopaths use to confuse their, their spouses, their partners? Let me answer that question by first saying something that might be upsetting um, to some okay. of your listeners. Yeah. And yeah. Um, illuminating and life changing to, to others. Okay. And it is the basis of everything I do. And that is I ascribe responsibility to people who are in dysfunctional relationships. And my mm-hmm. whole book, the human magnet syndrome explains that. Um, but the difference between 
the narcissist and the codependent, the codependent can get better and heal and overcome their obstacles. But I say that it's because this is not a simplistic problem. It's not the innocent victim and the horrible perpetrator. Um, that the sociopath, the one who needs to hide behind the, their, the, the, the painting, the constructive image of themselves requires a certain personality who is susceptible to believing um, and falling for their gaslighting or manipulation. And that person often is someone who is codependent or who what I call have self-love deficit disorder. And although I don't wanna explain that now, and it is explained yeah. in my book, it's important because if someone is what I call balanced or psychologically healthy, which essentially means you have problems, it right. just means you don't have um, any uh, psychopathology, they almost always can figure out and sense something is wrong with a sociopath. Um, right. They might not know in, um, everything or uncover everything. And I say that because a sociopath can sniff out um, the potential uh, victim that is going to fall for their bag of tricks, their right. illusions, their disappearing act, their recreation of their, of their um, life story. Right. So as much as we talk about who are these sociopaths and what do they do, I want your listeners to please consider that if they work on their, what I call self-love deficit disorder or codependency, they will be happy and alive and their vision for healthy people and dysfunctional people will be ever so more, more, more clear. I'm not saying it's your fault. <laughs> but as a psychotherapist who has fallen victim to pathological narcissists, liars, manipulators. Um, the only way out was for me to figure out why I kept replicating that pattern. And of course, that was my self-love deficit disorder or codependency. So if you asked me, what is the technique and strategies and yeah. how these pathological narcissists, these sociopaths entrap you, I say first, and I say this, and this might be a little bit disturbing, but it, hopefully it'll conjure up um, an, a good, um, a a strong image. It's like a pedophile look, um, who goes to a um, playground and he's able to sniff out the one child who is the most vulnerable, who doesn't have relationship with parents, who has low self-esteem, the profile of the one that he will be able to trap, um, abuse. Sociopaths in these type of relationships are the same. They can sniff out that one person who is susceptible to their cunning, manipulative, gaslighting, reality bending strategies. And right. that person is almost always an SLD or codependent. It's good for our listeners to know that this doesn't happen in a vacuum, that this is, mm -hmm. there is some role to play and some um, self-discovery, dare I say, to maybe go on. Um, not, okay. It's not fault or blame, yeah. it's right. a role. And with right. the role, you can come up with a solution. So let's talk about the mechanisms. And I think our listeners will um, recognize this, the mechanism by which you're kind of slowly um, sort of uh, I, I dipped into the soup of the narcissist's world and thinking and how you can kind of lose your own self and your own thinking around being in relationship with this person. How do they do that? What do they do? Well, first of all, they are... Um, like an engineer, a mechanical engineer is to building um, or creating a machine. They understand these pathological narcissists, these sociopaths, they understand the inner workings of a codependent's mind. They know exactly how to get in there, how to um, exploit their vulnerabilities and what to do, not to do, how long to do it um, in order to cement um, a narrative, um, a gas lighting narrative that they are good, a good person. They are the protector. They are the hero. They are so incredibly skilled and capable at presenting themselves 
to the SLD or codependent um, as someone that they always needed and looked for. Right. Gaslighting works when they can manipulate the person's environment, systematically manipulate their environment and make them feel that they, they have a problem that never existed a, um, or they have a problem that existed that was mild or moderate and they can manipulate the person to believe that it's far worse than it ever was all the time, making themselves the person who protects them, who understands them or empathizes. And right. to do that, they have to find a person who is susceptible to this type of mind warping manipulation. What are some other examples of the kinds of narratives that might get told to a victim? SLDs or codependents suffer from pathological loneliness, a bone aching existential um, chronic problem. They find these extremely lonely people who are in need of affection, attention, uh, and some um, sex, physical intimacy. Um, and so they create a persona, um, a backstory that gives these people what they always wanted. And because they're sociopaths um, and they don't have um, empathy or remorse, they don't have what we call cognitive dissonance when, um, when they lie. A person who is not sociopathic experiences tension, sometimes anxiety when they lie, and some are able to hide it better than others. The sociopath has none of those internal uh, reactions. Therefore, their manipulations, their reformulations of their personality see are flawless, um, worthy of, of an Oscar performance. And they find an SLD, they present themselves as a specific version connected to what the SLD has always wanted or needed. They are cunning uh, listeners, and many of them have uh, very, very strong psychological backgrounds. And once they figure out what the SLD or the codependent needs, and from this point on, I'm going to refer to codependent as SLD, someone okay. who is self-love deficient. Thank you. Um, yeah. And... Um, and then they construct their backstory, their persona, because they're so good at faking. And um, the SLD feels like they hit the jackpot, the perfect right. person. Right. And it's hard to detect because they don't show the signs of, you know, of typical liars, manipulators, because they're the consummate actors. And right. once they prove their value to the SLD, they start to manipulate the environment and focus on certain aspects of what's wrong with the SLD, what they're struggling with. And they bring attention to that. And in, in a sense, they tr prove to the SLD, the, the codependent victim, that they have this problem. And by manipulating them, the environment, um, they experience this problem as evidence and then they incorporate it and acknowledge it into who they are. And once that happens, um, that is, that's the engine. That is a primary mechanism of gaslighting is to get someone to accept something that's negative or harmful, demeaning or diminishing about themselves, prove that to them and make them believe that the narcissist, the sociopath is the hero and the caretaker and that connects them in this almost symbiotic caretaking, um, care needing relationship that um, ultimately isolates them from the outside world, um, which deepens their future and ultimate uh, personal, social, and psychological uh, deterioration or destruction. Thank you for giving, walking us through that process because I'm reminded of how this might specifically play out in the life of a straight partner um, in, in that. So for example, you might um, come to your partner and say, you know, are, are you sure you're not, are you sure you're not gay? Do you think you might be gay? Do you think you might be a lesbian? Do you think, you know, and that person will then flip that on you and you are just the most awful wife in the world for asking such a thing for even thinking such a thing and right. and then it's like oh my god i am this horrible horrible wife or partner or spouse i i can't believe i ever doubted my partner i can't believe i 
thought that about them. I can't believe I asked that question of them. Um, where was I even getting that? And like you almost go down this rabbit hole yourself of questioning your own, re- not only questioning your own reality of the symptoms, the hints, the right. information that you've received, but now you're an awful person for bringing it up and putting it on the table. Um, or like, you know, you might be your anger might be provoked. And then when your partner says, look at an angry person you are, yes. you know, okay. you're, you're just like, oh my God, I'm, I, I have anger issues now and I'm such a temper and oh my gosh, I'm, I'm a horrible person. Look at when the anger was initially provoked to begin with. So it's really right. mentally twisting. For a person who is pretending to have a different sexual orientation than they really have for uh, for purposes of manipulation and exploitation, which is kind of what we're talking about in this podcast. Right. They have to first establish their legitimacy as the caretaker, the altruistic, empathetic, honest, loving protectorate. And then they have to establish this narrative, this implanted narrative, that if you should question them, if you should doubt them, that you should be ashamed you should be embarrassed. You know, similar to someone with whose religious belief in God, the and if you belong to a, a church, synagogue, or a mosque that that punishes people to question it, um, and may, and basically tells them um, what, what we call you know the double bind. If you question it, you must not believe in him. Therefore, just the mere act of questioning someone is this gaslit narrative. You are sabotaging a relationship. So when the, the sociopath establishes that narrative that there's no room for questioning. If you do, that means you're dishonest, you're distrusting, you're paranoid. And if they can successfully manipulate, manipulate a person to believe that any such questioning of that is indicative of what's wrong with them, then it, it's the gaslit narrative. It's the thought process that was implanted in them that wasn't theirs originally. And what that does, it is the safety mechanism for them, these sociopaths, that allows them to um, hurt, manipulate with impunity. And so what you're talking about is the essential gaslit narrative that keeps them from being discovered or outed by um, their victim partner. Right. There's a, you know, there's another very common example of this and it, and it happens with intimacy. And if there's not intimacy happening in the relationship because of one individual's sex, because this, both sexual orientations are fundamentally not a match, right? And, and the straight partner says, you know, why aren't we having intimacy? What, what's going on with this? And the, the closeted partner um, will say, you know, well, it's because you're too fat or it's because, you know, I, you're, you're all over me and I can't stand it. And having sex with you is disgusting and you're disgusting. And and then you go down this rabbit hole of, you know, then you're all of a sudden you're, you know, running off to Weight Watchers and trying to, you know, scramble okay. onto a treadmill five hours a day to lose 20 pounds. And then when that doesn't work, it's still, um, it, it's maddening really. And, and, but I, I'm glad that you said that it's about, it's a protective mechanism to keep the facade in place. It keeps the, the narrative of the picture in place. It's very similar to um, uh, sociopaths who are religious figures. Um, mm-hmm. If you should, uh, who cult figures, if you should question them, you are questioning the, the word of God. Now, I, right. I, like to, I like to give you some constructive feedback or I like to yeah. teach you something. Please, <laughs> Is, please. Um, um, I do not consider the type of person we're talking about as a closeted individual. <laughs> the person who is closeted is not a psychopathology. Right. It might be not, it might be unhealthy for them and unfair. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It might be something that um, requires, you know, psychological intervention, but is not indicative of sociopathy or uh, right. it is the sociopath is not in the closet because he is afraid or she is afraid. They're not afraid of rejection or judgment. They are actually hiding and they don't Mm -hmm. really care uh, what people think of their sexual orientation, their sexual choices. 
They only care about exploiting a person, a relationship or relationships um, right. through this misrepresentation of themselves. With regards to being closeted, let me be very clear. There are people who are in denial about their own sexual orientation. Um, and denial, as I used to um, explain as a joke in my training, which I now use as, as a very clear explanation, is an acronym for don't even know I am lying. Of course, no is spelled wrong. Right, right. And, and so the closeted individual, if they are in denial, they don't know about it because they so deeply fool themselves. And if they are closeted and in denial um, and they're in a relationship, well, that's a really big problem, but it's mm -hmm. not a sociopathic manipulative process. It's a mental health process because at right. that point, they're now so disassociated from their true identity. If you are closeted and you have a strong sense of morality and honesty, you will not be in a relationship that will hurt someone else um, because of this withheld right. part of your life. Now, in reality, when you come out of the closet, more often than not, everyone already knows. They just didn't say anything. And, right. if, and if they don't know, more often than not, they're happy because they love you and mm -hmm. they have unconditional love and they want you to be happy. Now, they, right. you can be happy and supportive and be mad. Like, I can't believe for 10 years you're my dad and you made me think you were this and now you're that. Right. And then if you're a good dad or a good mom or, or friend or pr partner, you give people the opportunity to be mad. But so the whole closet phenomenon is nothing to do with the sociopath. They are not struggling with their sexual orientation. They are hiding right. it from personal gain. Thank you for that, because this is what makes it such a difficult thing to talk about is because, and, and even I find myself tripping over myself and, right. and parsing my words and, um, and even to a certain extent, uh, nervous to do this interview, to talk about this, because we know that this happens because we pathologizing people who are not sociopaths <laughs> who happen right. to be LGBT, who also happen to be closeted. But when you get this combination of someone who is as you say, not closeted, they, I, I'm glad that you said that, that they don't really care, but they're in, they're in hiding to begin with about all the aspects of their personality and the sexual orientation is maybe just one of them. And that interacts with the, the idea or, or that is part and parcel of the experience, which see, even now I'm kind of like, how do you even tease all of this apart and, and not conflate everything? Well, because that's and, not what we're trying to do. Yeah. And let me, let me simplify but in my understanding that someone who's in the closet, there are so many psychological, personal factors behind it. And, but they are not necessarily psychopathic. Right. Um, a personality disorder is independent of someone's sexual orientation right. and choices about that. The sociopath lies about their sexual orientation because if they are honest about it, whether it's, a lover, a person, a relationship, a job, it would result in them not being able to exploit others. Right. And, and okay. it, is, it is calculated. For example, um, I have a client of mine who was in this, was married for 15 years to a woman who got him to believe that he was sexually inept, that he had chronic erectile dysfunction um, that he never had before that he was not a good lover, that he didn't take any interest in making her feel good. And as a result of that, she shut down the opportunities for physical intimacy. She right. got him to believe that he was inept in bed, got him to believe that he did not understand how to please a woman, got him to believe that he was sexually inexperienced and that he was just an overall um, selfish person. Now, by successfully doing that, her hidden sexuality, uh, her sexual orientation, which I believe um, she is a lesbian, he never questioned because he so severely judged himself. But this could only work if he knew that if he should question her, there would be a severe consequence 
that would ultimately be his disloyalty, if that's a word, right. his lack of loyalty, right. his right. lack of right. trust. And that would make him feel worse. Right. And when he's so entrapped by this double bind, he has identified with everything that she said he's not, which really is her. And that's the, and, right. and I, I ask your listeners, my viewers, to consider that, that some of the gaslighting or manipulation that narcissists do in judgments are really statements about themselves that it wasn't until our psychotherapy he started giving me telltale signs of um, a woman whose sexual orientation uh, was with um, same sex. And it was so clear because I did not have the gaslit um, cloud um, around me to mess with my judgment. Right. Thank you for providing that example, because that's exactly the relationship that we're talking about on this podcast. <laughs> so that I think is the, the clear, um, the crystal clear example of, of the relationships that are so, so difficult, I think, for um, people to heal from too, because there isn't a core uh, reality that you have to, it takes a long time to get back to a sense of core reality to get that fog out of your psyche and off of your, um, out of your mind so that you can kind of claw your way back to a sense of, okay, this is real. I'm here. This is up. This is down. Um, all but of that that I was living before was just a, a, a fog. I, I wish it was that simple. I wish it because mm. people would get healthier. But yeah. get, the, the problem with gaslighting is not a fog. It is mm. deeply embedded with yeah. all of these safety mechanisms that the narcissist puts in that if you should doubt him or try to break or oh, right. break free, the consequences get worse. Okay. Uh, and so you can temporarily come out of the fog, but because they're the gaslighter, the pathological narcissist, um, the person who is lying about their sexual orientation um, has so severely turned you against yourself and, and isolated you and, uh, um, and tore, tore down your self-esteem and your beliefs and your own judgment um, that what's left over, if you should see um, the person more clearly and the, cloud, uh, the fog lifts, then there is danger for severe consequences. So right. the gaslighting pathological narcissist sociopath builds, builds in into their gaslighting regimen um, this safety mechanism that if you should start to recognize them, that there's going to be a consequence that you mm. are as a victim going to blame yourself. You're right. Once again, you're being paranoid. Look is what happened in all your relationships. Gaslight. Once again, you're insecure. L- look at all of what happened because they proved to them these things. Um, right. You are doubting my sexuality. You are the one that has the problem. If only you did this, I could do that. Right. And, and sometimes the worst is the projection, is, is to put onto others what you don't want to accept about yourself. And, and I've had, in this one example, this man and this gaslighting sociopath uh, woman, that she actually referred to him as gay. You must be gay because um, you're, you're not getting an erection. Um, because she unabashedly, without any shame, knew that that was his vulnerable spot. If this was an pl- explicit podcast, I would I would cuss up a storm right now because <laughs> okay. that's some, well, that's, that's uh, some epic yeah. that's some epic bleep. <laughs> I know, and you know what? You know what? I have been hurt by gaslighters. Yeah, you have, and we survived. And and fortunately, um, we and other people are trying to help others. But if you have experienced this, and you hear someone explain it to you, like people did to me years ago, and I'm trying to do to your uh, listeners and my viewers, it's really upsetting. It's like yeah. it's like holy bleep bleep bleep. What the bleep bleep bleep? Yep. Right. What do they do? Right. And so, if yeah. you guys are experiencing that, it's okay to be mad. It's okay right. to be enraged, because right. that's the first step. If you're gaslit, they took that response out of you and turned it into self doubt depression because if you can't get mad and you turn it inside then you get depressed Depressed. and powerless yep and and frozen 
Thank you for saying that. I am so glad that you said that because a lot of people do not understand why some straight spouses have the rage that they have. <laughs> or even, even, even people who have, are the victim of, of heterosexual narcissists, the, the rage that when you begin to understand what happened, but the anger that the self-love deficit disorder person has or the codependent has um, about the gaslighting, the, the rage. And, and you were saying and validating, I think, that if you feel that rage response, that anger response, that that's normal, it's healthy because repression is where we get depression. We get something pathological and awful. And I'm so glad that you said that because there are a ton of people out there who are feeling kind of levels of mad about what's happened to them or what they've endured that is kind of crazy making mad. Well, the actual crazy making is when someone should, a gaslit individual should suspect that their lying, manipulative, predatory um, lover, partner should be something that are not. They get crushed from the, the gaslit narratives that you're bad, disloyal, and all the things I, I've told you. And then if they should get angry, if those gaslit narratives are firmly implanted, they automatically turn that anger into themselves because right. to project it to its appropriate source um, makes them a bad person. And right. when the gaslighter can turn, redirect that anger in, uh, back to the person, they become weaker, more, uh, more dependent, more fragile. And so they get depressed and, and without the free expression of appropriate anger, it gets expressed in psychogenic or medical or physical problems. And it's beyond the scope of this, of this discussion, mm -hmm. but whether right. it's fibromyalgia, headaches, um, these people get sicker. And more often than not, when that occurs, the gaslighter um, internally, the psychopath claps his hand and goes, yay, because the sicker they get, the more dependent they are and the more they are going to be stuck with this person and be afraid to leave them. And that's crucial to the gaslighter who is hiding their sexuality for the purposes of manipulation and ex exploitation is the, remember the, 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 the safety mechanism that's implanted that if they should um, even think that their loving protective partner, and I should quote that, uh, will leave them, they will be absolutely terrified and therefore they don't even think to question. We have bitten off a good chunk, although I know that there's so much more that can be canvassed about this topic and, and discussed and shared and learned. And we haven't even talked about recovery from this, coming out right. of this. Um, that's a whole nother topic. But I wanna, I wanna give you an opportunity to give any final thoughts to our listeners yeah. who might yeah. be um, uh, you know, struggling with either they're still in these relationships or they're just out of these relationships. Um, yeah, I wanna uh, let you so the, speak to them, yeah. So the bulk of my work after I wrote the human magnet syndrome um, is on how to solve the problem, which I call the codependency cure. And I won't uh, even t um, summarize it, but that information is available at, at, at my website that we'll talk about in just a few yeah. minutes. But I say that because there is hope there is a plan, there is strategies that can pull a person out of this um, or help them to stop destroying themselves after that person left them um, or came out of their closet <laughs> um, and destroyed um, um, their, their family. You can solve this, you can rebound you just have to understand the importance of self-love. If you hate yourself, you can't overcome this. Mm -hmm. And the hate, self-hatred is part of what the sociopath does. But if you can heal the reasons that have created your self-love deficiency, or your self-love deficiency disorder, you can see the light, embrace your past as a learning experience, learn to love yourself, heal, and because the human magnet syndrome is very, very predictable, you will then be attracted to a healthier person. And if a sociopath lying manipulator comes your way, you will automatically feel like something is wrong. 
and you will exit that scene. Exit that scene. I think that's the perfect note. And I think that gives us a lot of hope and it's the perfect note to end the podcast on. Um, I think we all want to be able to exit the scene when someone comes into our lives who's not good for us, no matter, no matter who they are. Um, thank you so much, Ross, for being a part of our podcast today. I I have a feeling this is going to help a lot of people. I want to um, remind our listeners that they can find out more about Ross Rosenberg and his work at his website, selfloverecovery.com, as, of course, he's the author of the book, The Human Magnet Syndrome. Thanks again, Ross, for being a part of our show today. We really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Mm-hmm.